we're going to switch gears a little bit here and have some uh, talks on horticultural applications. And our next speaker is Mark Percival. He's with AgriSense. It's a um, horticultural extension enterprise. And he has dealt extensively with um, plant nutrition, hydroponics, and plant health, and also teaches at the uh, North Coast Institute of TAFE's Coffs Harbor Education Campus on various horticultural topics. So I would like to present um, Mark Person. <laughs> Very much. Um, I'm Mark Percival. I'm the uh, principal of AgriSense. I've uh, run this business, I suppose, for the last six years um, in Coffs Harbour. Being a horticulturist of about 30 years' experience and, uh, and dealing in production of horticulture largely, uh, I do a lot of teaching at the local technical and further education college, um, TAFE. That's, uh, that's under great threat at the moment for cost efficiency reasons. Um, and uh, I'm moving back into my consultancy phase in a big way. Um, today I want to talk about an overview of, of the way perlite is, uh, is slowly starting to be adopted in Coffs Harbour and, and what I suppose the historical aspects of Coffs Harbour have been as far as horticulture is concerned and why somebody like me that's been trained in, in nursery production can walk into a place that has hundreds of farmers and they're actually working in what I would regard as, um, as early 1900 technologies. Um, it, it's quite amazing, but it's a fabulous opportunity as well, um, in some respects. Um, Coffs Harbour is around about uh, 320 miles north of here. It's on the coast. Um, it's a, a beautiful place. It's got uh, a, a confluence of temperate and tropical climates coming right onto its doorstep. The, uh, the Great Dividing Range comes right up virtually to the beach. And you've got this very, very steep, picturesque place that looks fantastic from sea, and, and unfortunately looks a little bit like uh, some of the worst parts of LA from land. Um, <laughs> you're, you're basically in this situation where there have been no architects. <coughs> they, they tend to get chewed away. Um, however, that is changing. Coffs Harbour's now got the NBN, so it's starting to be a very, very popular place as far as uh, people are concerned. Great place to go and catch a fish. Great place to, uh, to try and grow a banana. And an even better place to grow hydroponic product. Um, it's, it's a decent, manageable temperature. Most of the year the temperature is around about 30 degrees Celsius. Um, in the summer, in winter, we get down as low as around about 18 degrees Celsius. The 30th parallel is where Coffs Harbour is, so it's the 30th parallel on the coast, probably most livable climate for people. Um, we have in Coffs Harbour a very, very large number of Indian growers. We've got a very large Punjabi Sikh community. It's probably the largest Sikh community um, outside. Uh, Shepparton region of Australia. Um, we have a large blueberry growing presence there and that all came from a very large banana industry that started in about the um, the late 1800s from a fellow called Herman Reich. I'll just get used to using this one, so. Uh -huh. So, part of Singil. Uh, probably one of the smartest and, uh, and um, most charming and amenable people you'd want to meet um, has, has just taken on perlite growing um, as a complete method, quite differently to the rest of his, uh, his kin. He's basically um, one of the kind up there at the moment. We're happy to make him one of a hundred. Um, he works as, primarily as a blueberry grower and these greenhouses that he's, uh, he's running are basically there to bring labour in for his blueberry pick. So when we start thinking about the hydroponic industry in Coffs Harbour, it's, it's pretty well misunderstood by most of the people that are in it. They don't understand its, its potential for profit making. They don't tend to understand its potential um, 
growth is, and importance as far as, as food supply is concerned, and also the versatility that you can have. Now, Pardip is an absolute radical. He has started growing tomatoes, okay? Um, everybody else in Coffs Harbour grows uh, cucumbers, Lebanese cucumbers, and they're all done without heat, and they're all done in sawdust. Um, the reason for this is, I suppose, um, one group of people, the Howarth brothers, in around about 1993, started to grow Lebanese cucumbers in 25 mil, or 25 metre, I should say, polyethylene tunnels, and they made a lot of money on it. They were growing in sawdust. I turned up there in about 1995 as a patent fertilisers representative. And uh, having trained in, in nursery production, I nearly fell over. I just saw this place. I saw raw pine sawdust being used as a media. And I, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, I saw these plants. They, they looked like they were growing OK. And I walked out and I thought, yeah, right, I'll be dead in a week. Um, the fact is, they, they actually survive. They do OK for a certain period of time, and then they die. Okay, they, they basically aren't a fabulous substrate, these the perlite things. And with perlite, not perlite, so sawdust, with sawdust we basically see a lot of other substandard practices going on. So we actually have a group of people that are growing a hydroponic crop without any training. Okay, what they're, they're being trained by truck drivers and sales reps. And I find that really, really difficult as a teacher, an educator, and also as a, um, a <coughs> radio, radical fundamentalist horticulturist, okay, which is what I think they regard me as up there at times when I start talking about things like air fill porosity and uh, transpiration and um, profit benchmarking. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an unusual concept to them. They want hydroponics because they want good pickers through the season. They want to be able to stop their, their workforce from being itinerant because in Coffs Harbour they have the end of the blueberry season at around about the end of January. And between January and around about early April, May, um, nothing much gets picked and everybody's gone off somewhere else to pick somewhere else. So um, <coughs> this is a secondary industry. You can see that part of standing there in a um, a red path greenhouse, which is a, a beautiful piece of equipment. But what he's standing on is, um, is white weed mat. Um, and once again, radical fundamentalist horticulture is purist. Um, I really like seeing a concrete floor when I'm dealing with any kind of nursery issue to clean it out. Because at the end of each <coughs> crop, you want to get rid of disease. Now, one of the issues we have in, in Coffs Harbour is we have quite a bit of disease, quite a bit of plant disease, and we have quite a, a number of, of malleable people, not unlike Pardip. Pardip is, is really quite a smart guy, and you can tell when a, a rep's pulling his leg. Um, a lot of his, his uh, compatriots and colleagues can't. And so we basically see our use of pesticides, the wrong use of fertilisers, bad pruning techniques, um, shocking potting uh, techniques, and, and bad propagation techniques, as well as strange varieties being chosen for the inappropriate climatic conditions. So I don't want to sound too pejorative about all of this. Uh, I, I do respect these people. They work really hard and they're, they're very, very good at what they do when they actually get in the swing of things, but they really need some guidance up there. And this is a perfect opportunity, in my view, for the Pearl Light Institute to, to start disseminating a decent media in the area. Um, Perhaps up till around 19, 1926, most of the seed farmers came over and started cane cutting and growing bananas in Coffs Harbour. <coughs> they built the business up to contribute around about $70 million to quite a small area, a smallish um, country town. Coffs Harbour's got about 40,000 people now, and I think Woogles has got about 30. So we're, we're looking at this huge input of, uh, of means from just these few um, hard-working people. There was a number of Italian growers as well. That we have quite a large Italian con contingent in the bananas. And until about the mid-1980s, the bananas were quite a, a decent system for people to actually get involved in. Um, around the mid-1980s, Queensland got their act together. 
uh, Queensland got very professional. They didn't have the steep mountainous ground to work on that Coffs and Mulgulga farmers have to deal with. They had slightly better soils. We have uh, quite a, a horrid pod soil up there, which isn't a great thing to work with. Um, and they, they basically also trusted each other enough to, to actually have a cooperative packing system, which stopped them from duplicating resources and unnecessarily pouring capital into their enterprises. And so we had most of our Coffs Harbour farmers operating independently, not trusting each other, not sharing information. And, um, and then suddenly Queensland comes in, <coughs> their capital input or their capitalisation is probably going to be about the tenth of a, of a Coffs Harbour farmer. They can actually drive along without flipping their cars and, and go picking as far as their bananas are concerned and do it from mobile platforms, whereas there's nowhere in the world most places in Coffs can do that. And of course, Queensland, North Queensland is a tropical environment, which basically meant they could do three or four crops a year of bananas, whereas Coffsart was struggling to do one and a half. Now, there was a lot of marketing attempted to actually extol the virtues of something that hung on the tree longer and was a much sweeter banana and that kind of stuff. But toward the mid 80s, um, that was the beginning of the end for Coffsart. But by the time I got there, they were looking around for something else to do. And their marketing technique was waiting for a cyclone, a cyclone to devastate North Queensland. <laughs> okay, they got their prices up above break even, and so it was a very dis desperate industry. Um, about the end of, of the 90s, the DPI, the Department of Primary Industry, and, and Coffs Harbour banana growers got together. A lot of actually uh, seek banana growers, like um, like Pied got in touch with. Um, the DPI and asked how they could diversify and diversification was heavily on their mind. Um, they looked at, at the North American blueberry, uh, the highbush blueberry, and they started growing things like rabbit eyes and sharps and some of the varieties will actually grow in a subtropical climate. Um, that went from, or it took it from about two and a half thousand acres or a thousand hectares to the Aussies around here um, of bananas across to about the same amount of blueberries. Now we have some Asian bananas being grown. We have some, um, probably a few ladyfinger banana varieties, but the majority of the Cavendish bananas are all gone. So the Ducasse, which is a tartar banana and favoured by the Asian markets here, um, is, is still being grown in a small degree in Coffs Harbour, whereas the, the traditional Cavendish that they were using up there has, has gone altogether. And it's been replaced by these huge swathes of white netting to protect the blueberries from the birds up there. And of course, at the end of each of these huge swathes of white netting, we see a, um, about four or five poly houses. And most of them, at the moment, are low tech. We only have one or two people, such as Pardip, and every time I see him, I, I give him a bit of grief about not buying a slab, a concrete slab, for the base of his, his house and tell him I'd like him to have one next time he actually uh, clears his, his house out. And he says, well, right, mate, you pay for it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, this guy's actually forward thinking. He's, he's the, the one farmer up there that's actually consistently using perlite and saying, you know what? Everybody else around here has been wiped out by shorefly and by fungus gnat, and I don't see them. I don't get root disease. I can control my irrigation. They can't. Now, and this is the, the big thing perlite has against sawdust. Um, Labour's a huge thing. We've, we basically find that in, in this situation, we've got the problem where we, we don't have somebody that knows how to pick fruit properly. We don't know anybody that knows very much about pruning. The irrigation, fertigation, pest and disease and weed control uh, are restricted probably to um, chlorpyrifos, laws ban, and people don't want to use anything much else. Um, we basically have um, a need for a labour force that has a higher level of skills and a more complex skill set. But, you know, the Harvest Trail and the local students' backpackers um, don't supply these high quality workers and they don't hang around the place. Um, 
as I said before, we move into, we moved into hydro hydroponics to keep people in place. Um, the big thing about a lot of the uh, the seed farmers at the moment is that they are somewhat resistant to change. They're being run by old patriarchs um, who had come from the Punjab families early in the 20th century. Um, they they romanticise their techniques over there. I had somebody tell me the other day in a class that you know we we farm rice the same way as we did 600 years ago. We don't have any problems. Why would we change? What you're talking about is too expensive. Um, and, and I can understand that as, as a, a mentality, but I don't believe that these guys can actually maintain a high level of profitability, particularly when we start looking at places like New Zealand and Chile that are starting to compete against them in their blueberries with slightly, slightly better techniques. Um, marketing isn't a very big thing for, among them either. They're not sort of talking about working out when the market is going to be available. They, they will basically grow cucumbers through the middle of summer even though everybody else in, a, in Australia is growing cucumbers and just accept the fact that they're actually making um, a loss on each box they sell. Oops. And, um, and there's this very, very high level of reluctance to share information, even among people that are selling things in the same brand. Okay, so when we start looking at a situation where we're selling, say, an Osberry's blueberry, or an Osberry's cucumber, or an Osberry's tomato, um, I'm being sworn to secrecy about the, the actual nutrient mixtures I give people. Um, basically because they don't want the person that's actually selling with them, contributing to their brand image, to know how to grow things well. Um, they want to have their own independent success. And this harks back to, I suppose, the, um, the banana growing days. And it's not just the Sikhs that are doing this, it's also the, the Italians and some of the Australians as well. Don't you tell us about what I'm doing, all right? It's, uh, it's just not on as far as that's concerned. I keep on running around the place and once again being uh, a weird conservative, or non-conservative, a weird sort of a, a fundamentalist uh, type, I basically say, but don't you want everybody to sell a good piece of fruit for <coughs> Osberries? Or would you prefer somebody to get a bad grass bit of fruit and never buy anything from your lot for another six weeks, thereby spreading the word around the market that you guys sell bad fruit? And they just think that I'm, I'm running a spurious argument. But that research was done here in Australia by a mob called Rurdick, um, Royal Industry Research and Development Corporation. And if somebody bites into a bit of bad fruit, it turns them off that fruit for six months, no, six weeks, as a minimum and six months and sometimes forever. I had a girlfriend that would never ever eat another kiwi fruit because she felt that they were all rubbish after one bad experience. Um, so we've got to be really careful when we, we actually go up there marketing to these people that we, we don't sort of want to drag them along a path where they're, um, they're given a, a story that tends to, um, I suppose, confuse them. And, and we are getting some really confusing messages and typically speaking from uh, seeds companies, from fertiliser companies, from the new wave of fusion farmers and there's some amazing mythology going around the place and you know the truckies love this, they keep on spreading it left, right and centre and confusion is, um, is one of the biggest industries in Coffs Harbour. Um, when I turned up there, Neville and Ross Howarth from Carora had cucumbers and then tomatoes and sawdust, and they did really quite well. Uh, the problem up there too is that most of this stuff is run to waste. And run to waste means that basically things go into the environment. And they go through an organic substrate in the sawdust situation to the environment, and that contributes around about 50, 50 tonnes of nitrogen to a pristine environment a year. Okay, that's going to the creeks and it's going to the, the Saltry Islands National Park and the sea around the place. Now, one of the big movements at the moment in this country, in hydroponics, from people like the National Greenhouse Centre up in uh, Summersby, is to start changing water quality methods, start recirculating water, start recycling and filtering water and, and basically reducing our water usage, because we believe that we're going to be starting to get a bit short on water and that a lot more people are going to start moving into protected cropping, such as greenhouse usage. 
If you try to recycle water from cucumbers, you've got a lot more filtration that needs to be actually dealt with. There's a lot more organic matter coming out of them. There's usually a lot more disease to be dealt with. And, and it's a bit harder to get a reliable representation of nutrient coming through there because no sawdust source is standard or uniform. Um, they don't compost sawdust. Hence, a lot of people that have picked up hardwood sawdust and put it through have destroyed an entire crop. Basically, it won't germinate because there's too many fennels in the hardwood eucalyptus stuff. It has to be composted beforehand. So the sawdust is not inert. It's exceptionally reactive and it'll break down through the period of the crop growth. And this is one of the issues that we find um, is, is dogging most of this in this industry. They basically are getting some awful diseases, gummy stem blights taking off in a big way. So is um, bacterial wilted tomatoes, clavibacter back to michiganensis. Um, sawdust, I believe, is one of the things that, that is actually helping that one along. Because basically people are using sawdust have the level of training that allows them to sit their pots in the drain and allow that to be infected by the pot that comes next. So the, the disease moves down the water area into a very, very poorly drained plastic shopping bag. Okay, you know, little plastic shopping bags, little, the, the things on. That's about the quality of containerisation in this industry. And, and this is where I'm saying we, we really need, to actually, as the industry, to get together and do a bit more education of the people that are in this, because not only will they make a lot more money, that means they'll buy more from things from people like you and I and it will make us a little bit more wealthy. It will probably make our environment a lot safer. The big thing about sawdust is that it's cheap. Um, 20 bucks a metre versus 200 bucks a metre. Okay, But it's a single use. Uh, and I've, I've been in um, workshops where I've had uh, the amusing experience of watching two farmers turn up, two people from TAFE, and several, seven people from the DPI. And those seven people from the DPI are actually trying to justify reusing sawdust the second time without any kind of heat treatment. Anybody in the nursery industry knows that if you're going to use an organic substrate, you actually do a pasteurisation before you try to reuse it again. Because there are so many diseases that basically turn up. And we're talking about a place that has, through summer, sometimes 80 to 90 per cent humidity. Uh, gets exceptionally high rainfall. We've had up to four and a half metres in a, a year. Um, of rainfall at Coffs Harbour, that was in 2009. Um, and as a result of that, um, perfect conditions for disease and, and indeed for pests to breed. So when we actually have pests, they move the diseases around and two of our biggest pests up there are shorefly and fungal gnat. Shorefly actually feeds on algae on the top of the pots um, and it is also sort of like a a sap sucker, so it goes into the vascular system of the plant and, and moves disease throughout the plant. Um, fungal gnat loves sawdust, hates perlite, <coughs> goes into a, uh, a feeding frenzy around the root system of the plant, eats lots of plants, plant roots, but also eats the sawdust around the plant roots. And um, we don't have what we call um, a reasonably conducive situation for, uh, for respiration to take place. Okay, we basically lose all of our air fill porosity. So when we look at sawdust, we're in a, a situation where, yes, it's a tenth of the price, it can't be reused, and it will be guaranteed to reduce your crop viability by at least 30%, if you're lucky. And media awareness isn't knowing how we're actually going to be uh, dealing with the next newspaper person that comes along. We're talking really here about trying to get a, um, an understanding of protected cropping principles. And, uh, you know, I don't know very many people up there that have had a look at, say, the Ball Red Book, which is what most nurserymen that get trained down this end of the, the woods tend to actually use as a standard text. Um, but to my way of thinking, if, if you're actually going to be growing something in protected cropping, you do look at the nursery industry 
and take a, a notice of things like hygiene and look, look at the types of nutritional regimes they've got and learn how to irrigate and do those types of things. Um, there's little or no formal training. There's a huge opportunity up there for that. Um, TAFE at the moment is winding down because of political issues as far as uh, government budgets, etc., is concerned. Um, there are some people with uh, risk training organisations that are actually starting to look at Coffs Harbour as a place to go and train. Uh, I suggest that I think a lot of the industries of reps around the place could actually do a lot of good by um, getting up there, having some specific, specific sessions on media, doing field days, getting trials underway, uh, getting some decent cooperators and getting these kinds of things happening that will actually build your business quite significantly. Um, most of the, the selection is based on input cost and as a result, failure is rife. It only takes one loss in 10 years to blow your entire net profit. Just one. Um, so soft pine, softwood pine, not composted. Some hardwood, not composted, usually fatal. Okay, so you can lose 1,200 bucks easily per greenhouse worth of seeds by just using some hardwood software, uh, some hardwood sawdust that hasn't been composted. Um, it's becoming less available, sawdust. Um, there are less and less pine plantations around the place. There are less and less timber plantations close to Coffs Harbour. And um, so it's, it's starting to increase in price. Um, it's non-sterile and the quality is totally inconsistent. There's no granulometry in it. There's, um, there's no species similarity, there's no age similarity, um, there's, uh, there's no hygiene practised in the sawmills that actually do the sawing. We've got a nasty little disease running around here called armillaria, and that is part of a, a symbiotic fungi that lives on the root systems of eucalyptus, and armillaria will nail everything. It really is quite a, a nasty disease. You get that in, in a lot of the sawdust that, um, that goes throughout there as well. Um, it's chemically reactive, you get a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus drawdown. So as soon as you start putting nitrogen on sawdust, you basically get the biological activity that breaks down to your lind lignans and, and that loves a lot of nitrogen. Of course, when you've got a, uh, a phos uh, an organic substrate, phosphorus is much less available. Um, combine that with some of the bores we've got up there as far as the, the water sources, high levels of iron, and we've got a classic uh, phosphorus drawdown situation that's going to actually reduce carbohydrate in the plant and give you a much more inferior product and a much less long lasting crop. Um, sawdust has reasonable water holding capacity. Um, its drainage is, is pretty awful and it doesn't wick anywhere near as well as, uh, as perlite does. So the wicking being the ability to draw, say, moisture from the bottom of the uh, 12 inch pot to the top. Okay, so. This type of stuff is just not happening as far as sawdust is concerned. And as I say, I was just absolutely stunned when I saw this stuff. Perlite's consistent. Um, it has a consistent pH, it has consistent uh, chemistry. Uh, it is disease free because it was pretty hot when it was made. Um, it's chemically inert. Uh, so we don't actually see any chemical interactions happening per se unless there may be a reasonably high sodium level in the water, then we've got a problem. But it's easy to control salinity in perlite than it is in sawdust because you've got more control over the drainage. Um, it's recalcitrant. It's not going to break down any further unless you step on it and crush it. Okay? Um, and some, some perlite is lost every time you basically do a repotting operation, but that's only about 20%. So you can actually keep about 80% of the perlite that you use and, uh, and keep on bringing a small amount in to, to bulk up the, the amount. Um, it has fantastic drainage and wicking situations and it, it actually is all, uh, I suppose, culminating in a crop that performs very well and is extremely durable. Um, I can get a six month crop out of uh, tomatoes, a nine month crop maybe. Um, I can get a six month crop out of cucumbers, but I think, um, in some cases, 60 days is what you get out of, uh, out of sawdust. So there's no way these guys can put something in May and say, well, I think the, the season's going to go kicking off sometime in the middle of winter when everyone gets hit with a frost and expect it to be there until perhaps October when there's a last nasty frost that wipes out all the other competitors. 
Um, so in those periods, they, they get a difference from in price of something like um, $45 a box, and 500 boxes a week um, per house, that's a fair bit. Okay, so if you're basically able to plan your, your system and keep things going reasonably well and have your crop stay there rather than just shut down because it's running out of air, it's got too many parasites around its root system, um, then you're, you're in the box seat, you're actually under control or you're in control and that's, uh, that's what you need to be in any business.